There's nothing more exhilarating than pointing out the shortcomings of others, is there? This video is made possible due to those who support me on Patreon, and I'd like to give a big shout out to patron Conrad Truitt. Thank you all for your support. At first glance, you wouldn't think me and my little sister had anything in common. She looks like she could slip seamlessly into the Gossip Girl universe while I am solely on my way to becoming the dude. Despite this, our relationship holds strong due to our two mutual loves, the films of the new French extremity movement and the absolute trashiest of trash TV. This is my life. This is my life. You, Chris Harrison. Back in the day, VH1 was our go-to for absolutely shit programming. Our favorite being Rock of Love with Brett Michaels, which is basically The Bachelor, except instead of the main interchangeable prick talking about romance and crap, it's just an aging has-been feigning sincere interest in a gaggle of women while drooling over their TNA like a 12-year-old. 25 of the most hottest women I'd ever seen. Look at that cut hot body. Yeah, you look, you look purely sexy. But a pleasant surprise we happened upon was VH1's The Pickup Artist, which featured the aptly named Mystery, a so-called master in the art of seduction, teaching a group of socially inept men how to approach, flirt with, and hopefully bed women. Yet little did I know, that despite my sister and I laughing our asses off at the cringe-inducing terminology and strategies, that years later, upon entering my senior year of college, I would become one of these dudes. Having had minimal dating and sexual experience, seeing a number of my male peers have success with women resulted in me developing a number of personal insecurities, which led me to the seduction community in an attempt to dispel them. And through utilizing the tips and tricks taught to me by these hyper-masculine gods, I embarked on what I will graciously refer to as a dating bender. I had all the apps going. Tinder, Bumble, Hinge, OkCupid, okay JDate, though the women I met there were none too pleased upon learning I was a Presbyterian. Hell, I even had some success on whitepeoplemeet.com when that was unfortunately an actual thing that happened in real life. Met a lovely gal there whom I sadly lost contact with. Ava B, if you're out there, hit me up, hun. Let's take that vacay to Argentina like we always talked about. When all was said and done, I had racked up a body count, if you will, of over 40 women in the span of about 18 months. My journey to slay and conquer, to solidify my masculinity, to attain personal fulfillment and self-confidence as a man was complete. And in the end, when the dust settled and the beta bitch clouds of my former self had dissipated, what was I left with? I was horribly depressed, all of my insecurities only got worse, I developed a dependence on alcohol and marijuana, I lost track of and or abandoned any and all hobbies or passions I had, I became alienated from my close friends, I lost out on a number of relationships with women whom I had sincere connections with, and to top it all off, my psychological connection between intimacy and sex became so damaged to the extent that it became infinitely easier for me to perform sexually with a woman that I hardly knew, whose name I couldn't even remember, while hammered out of my skull than with a woman I truly loved and cared for. Who's the man now, you, you beta bitch soy boy pussies? <laughs> So this video will act as a sort of spiritual sequel to my video discussing male celebrity body transformations. Following said video being promoted by the equally magnanimous as they are callously indifferent YouTube algorithm gods, I received an inundation of comments from folks sharing their insights on the topic. But there was one comment that stuck with me and it wasn't until going back to find it for this video that I realized it was one of the top rated. That comment from Jacob Sejonis, sorry if I messed up your name, was, I don't think I've ever heard anyone talk about men's body issues. What surprised me while making the male body video was that men feeling pressure to attain a certain body image isn't something that is covered up or obfuscated, it's blatantly apparent. But it seems our society doesn't consider it that big of an issue, as if it is a problem hiding in plain sight. And I would say there is a similar issue in regard to men's struggles when it comes to dating and sex. Well, I mean, people talk about it, but rarely in a way that is productive. Said discussion often and evolves into a clusterfuck of emotionally charged vitriol with terms such as feminism, MRAs, incels, toxic masculinity, and whatnot undoubtedly being tossed around, while the actual pressing questions are left by the wayside. Namely, what are the difficulties that men face when it comes to dating and sex? What leads to them being plagued by in some cases debilitating insecurities? Why are the current avenues that address these difficulties riddled with toxicity? And how can we address this problem so we can make a better world for everyone? Well, here I am 
attempt to give my best shot at answering these questions in a no BS manner. So this is obviously going to be coming from the perspective of and mainly targeted at straight men. So just keep that in mind as we dive into it. And I want to put out a disclaimer that I know some of you guys who do struggle with these insecurities and are watching this video may be a bit skeptical. Oftentimes when people seem like they are being empathetic in regard to this topic or even men's issues in general, it's usually just a springboard to promote a political movement or give you someone to blame. But as someone who not only understands the catalyst for what sends young men down this particular path, Path, but knows where that path leads, I would like to give a nuanced perspective on this whole mess to hopefully generate some productive discussion. And I promise to be as honest about my own experiences and feelings, no matter how personal or sensitive they may be. And with all that said, let's get into it. To begin, I feel like I need to discuss something that may raise a few eyebrows. And as much as it may pain me to do this myself, I think it is very important to lay out before we continue. So without further ado, Sorry, that hurt the type. If you go to YouTube and search pickup artists, the top results are all content creators, some very big ones, roasting the absolute shit out of these walking anal douches. And with good reason. Most of them are cringy as fuck, if not incredibly misogynistic. I think it's safe to say most have a pretty negative impression of anything related to this whole vibe. However, as someone who has had a lot of experience within this community, while I am not making a defense of the culture as a whole, I think it needs to be said that at least 80% of what these guys preach is actually effective practical advice. I know, but let me explain. When I worked at Barnes & Noble, yes I really did, no they are not sponsoring this video, those fuckers have been ignoring my emails for months, we had hundreds of books in the self-help section. Now let me ask you a question. Do you think each and every one of these books has some exclusive nugget of advice that has the potential to completely change your life? Or do you think they mostly just tout the same generic ass advice, be yourself, don't be an asshole, find fulfillment by learning to play ukulele or something, repackage to appeal to different demographics and or latch onto current trends? Yeah, it's not a trick question. The YouTube fitness community is I'd say very similar. Getting fit takes time and dedication, but for the love of God, it's not complicated. Yet you have Lord knows how many fitness channels that basically deliver the exact same information, just in different styles, tones, etc. It's more about who you as an individual relate and connect with to give you that information. You can basically say the same thing about most channels on a particular topic, whether it's makeup, business tips, or media analysis. Except mine, of course, which is a complete beast unto itself. Where else are you gonna get deep, long-form analysis on your favorite media and hard-hitting journalistic efforts exposing domestic terrorists that have yet to be brought to justice? Mark your calendars for my latest groundbreaking expose where I uncover Spyro the Dragon's recruitment by the ATF and his pivotal involvement in the Waco incident. While I am not the defending all these gurus themselves, the vast majority of what they peddle is just general self-improvement and in some cases practical and useful strategies to help someone who is socially awkward build a skill set that can be utilized not just in forming romantic relationships but also making friends or even career networking. Most of the advice you will find in say the mystery method or the art of seduction you'd find in any standard self-help or body language guide. It's just catered towards a particular topic, dating and getting laid, for a particular demographic, socially awkward dudes. That's the 80%. As for the other 20, we'll get to that soon. Looking back, the advice and strategies I learned from these guys, well, they did not work. Again, the principles these guys push are based on pretty sound socialization skills or even simple mental framings. For example, I am sure you have all heard of, oh God, negging, which many have condemned as a form of emotional manipulation. So, okay, let me approach this delicately. Now, originally, the idea of negging was to not make it immediately apparent that you were interested in a particular woman, maybe even saying something to disqualify yourself, as they say. Something like, eh, you don't seem like my 
type or something innocuous like that. YouTuber TLJ, who has also had experience in the pickup community, actually has an older vid briefly touching upon this and explaining its origins. Most women are inundated with dudes trying to hit on them. Negging is meant to make one stand out from the pack, perhaps making her wonder why this dude didn't do the same thing so many others did. Depending on how it's implemented, I wouldn't even consider this that much of a far cry away from playful teasing. So when laid out like this, well, negging really doesn't seem that bad. I mean, it isn't the best. It wasn't even something that I was a fan of myself, but it's not this evil act of emotional manipulation that many consider it to be, right? Where on earth did that come from? In order to attract lots of beautiful women, exploit flaws in her beauty. So this is probably what you thought of when I brought up negging. Giving a girl a backhand compliment, if not a straight up insult, to play on her insecurities so she will be desperate to win your approval. Nothing unstable about that at all. This is Matt Cross, host of wholesome family-centric channels The 33 Secrets and Alpha Male Secrets, both of which give advice to guys who want to get good with women while simultaneously converting them into raging unstable misanthropes. So this absolute chuckle fuck is a more extreme example of how that other 20% can take the good and practical 80% and utterly corrupt and poison it. Here is an older video of his about eye contact. The irony of him preaching strong eye contact while wearing sunglasses is not lost on me, and he uses some cringy terminology, but overall there is nothing grotesque about this particular video. But some poor dude who gets some useful information from that video may stumble across his other bangers like, women lack honor, morals, and ethics. Why a true wife is a virgin and the rest are concubines. Or maybe he'll sign up for this schmuck's 33 Secrets to Dating Beautiful Women course, featuring beloved holiday hits, such as beautiful and intelligent women are like UFOs laughing at the irony of him intending to use UFOs as a simile, but adding an apostrophe indicating possession. Beautiful and intelligent women are like UFOs what, Matt? Beautiful women gain their power at age 13. No red flags there. And my favorite on his list of how to approach and attract beautiful women, why approaching beautiful women doesn't work. <laughs> I know it's fun to mock this walking colostomy bag, but I also have to indicate just how toxic and borderline dangerous this rhetoric can be. It's a bit unsettling to see this dude has almost a quarter of a million subscribers between his two equally malignant channels. Now, am I saying that everyone who is subbed or will sub to these channels is as much of a bitter jaded troglodyte as he is? Not at all but herein lies the danger. In my experience, from speaking with those who got into pickup, the vast majority of these guys did so out of frustration. Not frustration at women or feeling as though they were owed sex, but due to them believing they were doing something wrong. They'll be out at a bar or club and see dudes with girlfriends or flirting and dancing with women as if it is just a normal part of life that so many people seem to manage so effortlessly. Over time, it starts to make one feel they are defective in some way. Now, some may say that a man being attractive to women, sexually and or financially, isn't an indicator of his worth in society. Well, we'll discuss that. Um, but believe it or not, for most guys who get into pickup, sleeping with dozens of women is not their end goal. Most just want a decent amount of social calibration and self-confidence so that if they do say meet a girl they would like to get to know, they don't fuck it up or lack the confidence to even say hi. A little awkwardness can be endearing, but we aren't talking about guys who just need a little push to talk to that cute girl at the bar. We're talking about guys who get heart palpitations at the thought of ordering a pizza over the phone. Add in societal conditioning of men to not admit vulnerability, and this can lead to these guys turning their frustration inward, resulting in severe emotional distress. And I have to hand it to the guys who decide to face it head on. But then douche magoos like Matty Boy bait these men who simply have the desire to improve their lives and pump them full of bitterness and contempt for women while simultaneously telling them to put their entire self-worth into whether or not said woman will sleep with them because how could that possibly end badly? That frustration that builds up in young men when they feel they are worthless or undesired, instead of being given help to alleviate it via healthy means, they're just given someone to blame. If you aren't successful with women, it's because women are whores, sluts, gold diggers, superficial bitches with zero accountability or self-awareness. Guys like Matt don't want you to find self-fulfillment because then maybe you'd realize how pathetic they actually are. They just want to keep you pissed off and jaded so they can bleed you of every dollar you have. But 
I can't deny that some of these dudes are incredibly effective at getting young men to take action to improve their lives. To be clear, I'm not talking about Matty Boy here. He is more at the tail end of the rabbit hole, which we'll discuss later. While it definitely is a mixed bag, there are gurus I have come across that are not as toxic as others, or really even at all. And since many of them are built around communities, this can help show these dudes that they aren't alone in their frustration and insecurity. That does come with the trade-off of these poor guys possibly falling down the rabbit hole and becoming bitter, or, like me, not realizing that their romantic difficulties may only be part of why they are unhappy, but we'll get to that later. The point I am making is that people characterize the entire community as filled with hatred and contempt for women, and thus, they throw the baby out with the bathwater, not acknowledging that the underlying principles these guys push help a lot of young men greatly improve their lives. However, now the obvious question. Why do dudes end up gravitating towards certain channels whose methods are coded with at best objectification, at worst, raging misogyny? Despite the term pickup artist having gone out of style, the methods are still around, simply rebranded under other banners such as Alpha Something or Social Dynamics, that's a big one. So why not get these tips and strategies elsewhere? Why not turn to a healthier, not as potentially toxic resource? Well, many dudes probably would, except this is just a little hand hampered by the fact that Today, the tides have definitely turned against the more toxic seduction gurus, and due to big YouTubers such as Habamurg, Taramukne, and Penguinzo roasting them to a crisp, it seems most have recognized them as certified cringe. However, channels in relation to this topic are still growing here on YouTube and elsewhere online. So, what gives? Why do guys gravitate towards these channels as opposed to an alternative? Well, let me use a little play to demonstrate. Hello there. I am a young man who has very low social calibration and no romantic experience. This is wearing tremendously on my self-esteem and I am desperate to gain the skills I need to hopefully be able to feel better about myself or even enter a fulfilling relationship. Hello there. We are the seduction community. We have been where you are and know how you feel and can give you the skills to improve your life. Oh, well, thank you, kind sirs. Whoa there. These guys may seem like your saving grace, but their methods may lead to you only seeing women as objects to be one. Ah, yes, I can see that. Glad you let me know this before I got too deep into it. Bye, cringe lords. No. Awesome. So, can you help me? Uh, help you with what? Well, like I said, I am pretty insecure when it comes to women. Oh, well, just be confident. Just be confident? Yeah, just, you know, be confident. There's plenty of fish in the sea. You'll, you'll find the right girl eventually. Well, thanks, but I... I was hoping for some more substantial advice. Like, my mom told me the exact same thing, and it isn't really all that practical or specific, so there may be a... Hello? If you check out the vast majority of dating advice aimed at men, and in general, come to think of it, outside of the seduction community, well, most of it is just useless bullshit. Like, it's not bad advice, it's just not specific or instructive at all. Oh, you want to get better with women? Well, all you need to do is be confident. Oh, of course, this changes everything. Again, we're not talking about guys who just need a little nudge, but guys whose lack of confidence is causing them extreme distress. Telling them to just be confident is like telling someone drowning in debt to just start a business. Like, dang for the financial strategy, asshole. You aren't giving them a game plan, something they can actually implement or improve on. Or how about just be yourself? Oh my god, it was so obvious, the wasted years. When people say this, what they mean is that you don't want to completely alter your entire identity or conceal your interests or passions to attract somebody. You'll always hear some idiot who's like, bro, don't tell a girl you like anime. Chicks think that fucking beta shit. Can you imagine that? Girls liking anime? A boy thing? Get the fuck out of town. But there are cases where, like, no, sometimes being yourself, and by that I mean the person you are as of this exact moment, is not always good. What if you are not wearing well-fitting clothes? Not well-groomed? Smelly? What if you have difficulty picking up on social cues? What if you dominate conversations, making others feel uncomfortable? What if your attempts at humor come off as insulting as you are not making it evident enough that you are being sarcastic? Can you guys get us some beer? Why, are you too stupid to buy yourselves? Oh, you guys look dumb. No, in these cases, 
Just being yourself isn't going to fly. And then there is advice, which is more like just appeasement. I am sure you love hearing, there is someone out there for everyone, or you'll find the right person for you, which if you plug into Google Translate and hit the stop bullshitting me button, you get, I don't know what to tell you. I am just trying to remove myself from this conversation and get on with my life. Sometimes the best way to help someone is to just be real with them. Whenever I hear, hey, do looks matter when it comes to getting girls? And people say, oh no, it's not that big of a deal. And it's like, of course it is. If you take two dudes, everything else the same, but one is just your regular run of the mill guy, and the other is absolute snack Aaron Samuels, yeah, the Sam man is going to have a far easier time in the dating world. To tell you anything different would be infantilizing. Same deal if you're a guy who is quite overweight. Are there cases where you may come across a woman who has certain preferences in terms of looks or weight or just won't care all that much? Of course, but yeah, being substantially attractive does make dating a hell of a lot easier. There's a shit ton of psychological research on how being physically attractive can have an effect on how people interact with you even on a subconscious level. I recommend checking out Psych IRL's video on this, which I'll link below. It's just something you have to acknowledge and accept. But while it may seem harsh to tell a guy his jawline ain't popping or that his weight is affecting his ability to find a partner, these are both things we can compensate for. Let's hit them all. Try some new clothes that complement your body. Get you out of your comfort zone. Let's hit the gym. You don't need to be shredded or have bulging muscles. Chicks do not care about that nearly as much as other lifting bros do. But let's get you to where it shows you're taking care of yourself. You still may not have the natural success of an aesthetic god king, but you can work with what you have. Oh yes, daddy. Okay, but what about things that you can't control? Height is a huge insecurity for many guys. But don't worry, you have plenty of articles reassuring you that height actually doesn't matter at all. Right? What are you fucking high? Of course height matters. A six foot three dude is going to have a much more successful dating life than a dude who is 5'4", like probably by accident. Is it fair that you will be disqualified from dating a woman whom you may have great chemistry with simply because she isn't attracted to you because of your height? Of course not. But what are you gonna do? Again, once you accept this, you can move past it. Make sure your look is optimized. If you're using dating apps, I'd recommend just openly stating your height. Maybe make a joke out of it, but there's just no use in hiding it and getting turned down later on. It's just a waste of your time. There are plenty of women who won't mind or won't care, but yes, most likely it will be a harder road. But once you accept that, then you can confront it with realistic expectations. I also could try and make you feel better by saying, well, if a girl doesn't like you because you aren't tall or are overweight, then she is just a superficial bitch and you shouldn't pay her any mind. Okay, so if you ever find yourself giving advice to people, don't ever do this. This is another issue with a lot of current dating and self-help rhetoric. While they aim to reassure and inspire, some of their rhetoric can actually lead to just as toxic attitudes, where in order to make someone feel better, they shit on others. Hey, don't worry about being overweight, honey. Guys like a little something something to grab onto. This may make some overweight girls feel better, but some poor girl who's insecure about her cup or ass size may take it to heart. It's one thing to tell a girl who just got broke up with by her boyfriend like ah who needs him he's an asshole like right after it happens but it's not good to internalize this part of being a healthy adult is realizing that not everything that bad happens to you is as a result of other people being terrible like sure if you're out with a girl and she whips out a tape measure and once she realizes you're a measly 5'11 and 3 quarter inches tall she spits in your eye and calls you a manly pussy I'm like okay that chick's a bitch but if a woman isn't attracted to a dude due to his height eh, it's just best not to revel in negativity I understand it's tempting to rationalize that she's actually just a stuck-up bitch, but this sort of sounds like something the walking colostomy bag would say, doesn't it? At worst, this can lead to you not being self-reflective about things you can or may need to improve on, or hater syndrome, where you assume anyone who tells you something you don't like or dislikes you is being a negative Nancy. Girl rejects you? Fuck her, she's a dumb slut who bounces on Chadcock. Guy didn't want to pursue a committed relationship? Fuck him, he's a man baby intimidated by successful women. And as noted, this isn't restricted to dudes. I have seen this happen a lot with women. People tell them any guy would be lucky to have them and they don't have to change one iota despite the fact that maybe there are things they are doing that are rude or are off-putting to potential partners that aren't being addressed. So there's this Jubilee video where this chick is doing speed dating with 20 dudes and at the start she's like, Yeah, I mean I'm hoping not to continue this pattern of very 
very bad men. But then she states the values she is looking for, which are being older than her, over a certain height, into rough sex, and liking to go clubbing. Which, like, okay, but those aren't really values. They're more like preferences. And not being flexible on them at all isn't an advisable strategy to finding a partner you can start a relationship with. So she ends up eliminating all the dudes, and in the end she says, I know what I want and there's nothing wrong with having these standards. And you know what? When I first saw the video, I kind of enjoyed seeing her end up alone. It sort of tapped into that side of me that holds animosity for the caricature of the stuck up superficial bitch. But looking back, I kind of feel sorry for her because I have a feeling that she probably was told throughout her life that she shouldn't have to compromise at all and that she will find someone who will check all of her boxes no matter how trivial or specific. It's not healthy to expect the 100% perfect person will fall into your lap without compromise or working on yourself, which is what leads to manic pixie dream girl syndrome for dudes, where people telling them, you'll find the girl for you one day, leads to these dudes not doing anything to improve themselves while expecting a unique and quirky girl with the aesthetics of a runway model to magically appear with a kooky hairstyle and Rugrats backpack, take them to the zoo where they'll enjoy a marvelous day of fun and laughter while taking pictures with her vintage Duro Daguro type camera that she always carries with her as it belonged to her father before he passed away and then take him home and fuck his brains out. If you've seen my video on male body transformations, you'll notice the same problem I spoke of in that context in this context context. Not being upfront with the harsh truths and realities of dating is not how you help people. Avoiding this can lead to unrealistic expectations that lead to people becoming incredibly down on themselves or lacking self-awareness. Well, okay, but all that stuff is just self-improvement. I don't think anyone has a problem with that. It's about the tactics, the strategies. But what purpose do they serve? Why is this the element that attracts so many guys? Well, let's talk about social calibration, which basically is just your ability to navigate social situations, pick up on social cues, body language. It isn't an exact science, just something you get a vibe or feeling for over time. So with that in mind, remember when Gillette released that the best men can be ad, taking a shot at toxic masculinity and everyone lost their collective shit over it. So there's one part where a chick is walking down the street and this dude goes to hit on her, but then his friend stops him. I specifically recall a lot of intense discourse over this part in particular, namely debating when is it okay or appropriate to approach a woman you may be interested in. This is one of the most common questions I heard when I was involved in pickup. Well, the answer is whenever you want. There is no law prohibiting you from hitting on a woman in any situation situation, so there's your answer. It is never not okay to approach a woman. But this completely depends on the situation and surrounding factors, which require a decent amount of social calibration to read. And even then, it is still quite up in the air, seeing as women are individuals with brains as opposed to assembly line fembots. There are situations where I'd say it's pretty cut and dry. You're at a bar and a chick is making dead set eye contact with you while smiling. Good to go, chief. She's being walked down the wedding aisle. I had your number. I mean, you can try, but despite what Hollywood may presume, I doubt you'll be that successful. However, what if she is just walking down the street, sitting in a coffee shop, in a bookstore? I mean, these seem okay, but what if she's wearing headphones? Looks like she's in a rush. What if her body language indicates she's not in a good mood? Do you know what body language indicates someone may not be in a good mood? Do all people demonstrate the same body language when they're not in a good mood? Here's a curveball. What if you're coworkers? I mean, it's not not okay, but it's complicated. Well, if she's giving you indicators she's interested, but are you sure she is, isn't being friendly? Is asking her out worth risking making from then on awkward as fuck or even losing your job? Part of the reason most dating advice is lackluster is that dating isn't anywhere close to an exact science. I am sure some guys were just asking the when is it okay to approach a girl question rhetorically just to be condescending pricks. But at least in my experience, most guys ask because they just don't know and don't want to make a woman feel uncomfortable. Most don't approach women at all for that very reason. You know what? I respect women. I love women. I respect them so much that I completely stay away from them. But if you are a guy who does want to gain experience with women, and considering men are almost always expected to make the first move, not that I think they should have to, simply that's the trend in our society it seems, this can be a fucking anxiety minefield. How do you know when to kiss a girl? Do you ask? Is that a turnoff? Well, not for some girls, but for others, some say that you have to wait for when she gives you the signal. 
But what is that signal? Do all girls give the same signal? Well, no, it depends on the woman. It could mean she wants you to kiss her, or maybe not. So should I just go for it? Girls like that, right? Well, some do, but some don't. Some girls would love it, while others would feel super uncomfortable. This is further complicated by some women, going back to how having unrealistic expectations can result in toxic attitudes, expecting dudes to be able to read their minds. Whenever I need a good rage, I look up threads of women talking about how they gave obvious flirty signs that guys were too dense to pick up on. Seems innocent until you remember these women aren't hitting on Professor Xavier. Some of the hints are more like failed attempts at telepathic communication. Maybe he missed your signal because it was too discreet. Maybe he thinks you were just being nice. Maybe he thought you were hitting on him but wasn't sure and didn't want to embarrass himself or make you feel uncomfortable. Maybe he had other experiences where a girl did something that seemed like a sign and he made a move and it ended badly. Or maybe he did know you were giving him a sign and he wasn't attracted to you or didn't feel like fucking at that moment. But instead of rejecting you, he played it off like he was dense because there are occasions where men don't want to have sex every single time they're offered it and the fact that a lot of people seem to believe this is indicative of a larger problem. And at the risk of stepping on even more landmines, how about when it comes to consenting to sex when alcohol is involved? I think we can agree that if a woman is passed out, so gone that a passing freight train wouldn't wake her, any non-straight up rapist would say she clearly cannot give consent, which you should always get before proceeding with sex. But it hampers the mood. It kills the vibe. If a three second exchange kills the vibe, there probably wasn't a vibe to begin with. Okay, but what if a woman agrees to sex, but she's clearly blitzed? Well, yeah, that's still a no. Well, what if she seems tipsy, but not that drunk? How drunk is that drunk? What if you are also drunk, making it harder to determine how drunk she is? What if a dude's drunk and asks a sober girl for sex and she says yes? Did she take advantage of him? Did she realize how drunk he was? Should people just not have sex while drinking at all? Is that a realistic suggestion? Were they on a break? Okay, let's just take a breath for a second. None of this was meant to point out some hypocrisy on the part of women or men or try and justify certain behaviors. The point was to lay bare the various questions I am sure many of you watching have asked yourself when it comes to dating, sex, consent, etc. I would love to tell you that there are simple answers for most of these questions, but that simply isn't always the case. The world of dating, attraction, and sex is messy, hypocritical, and in some cases downright scary. The only thing we can do is open discuss these treacherous topics and communicate with each other to make this less of a labyrinth. But the problem comes when we don't talk about it, when we're afraid of saying something that could be misconstrued or taken the wrong way, which leads to people not engaging in nuanced conversations, often taking hardline stances, which is why workplace harassment policies may contain seemingly over-the-top things like Netflix's five-second staring rule or NBC detailing proper hugging technique, or why the majority of people would probably raise an eyebrow at signing a consent contract before fucking. These measures are done with good intentions, but they're so dissonant from situations that people find themselves in and all the numerous factors that can be in play that nailing it down to strict guidelines is almost impossible. So let's say you're a socially awkward guy in your late teens. You have absolutely no experience in dating or romance, yet due to a constant bombardment of media, culture, and auxiliary social pressure telling you this is what normal people do, that it defines you as a man, and a general desire for connection and intimacy, it's beginning to wear on you tremendously. Thus, you decide to take the brave step of entering the dating world to quell your turmoil. So you check out some dating advice online, and you know, it's okay, with most of it just being generic stuff like be confident and be yourself, and maybe you go out there and try your best. But soon you learn that everything is way more complicated, the advice you were given was all sanitized bullshit, there are harsh truth when it comes to dating that no one was honest about, is it that surprising you might end up a little bit jaded? I'm not saying that those who give dating advice or trying to bamboozle dudes, these are very touchy topics and it's not always fun to talk about them out of fear you may hurt people's feelings or overgeneralize. However, I think there is one thing that is necessary to ensure healthy and realistic expectation when it comes to dating and relationships. So I am sure you have heard of the red pill, which is sort of a broad term for discourse concerning certain harsh truths of life, whether that be in terms of relationships, society, culture, etc. The reason I bring it up is because you will find that pickup culture and red pill discourse, while not really inherently linked, do overlap quite a bit. Saying things like being a short dude is going to make your dating life a lot harder, women may take into account perceived social status or even income when seeking a partner, women in many cases expect, if not require a man to make the first move, 
move. While statistical evidence shows that these are strongly supported observations, depending on how you internalize them, it can lead to undesirable outcomes. The red pill is presumably in response to the dissonance between how we say our society works and how it actually works. When it comes to dating and attraction, people don't want to say something that could be misconstrued, even if it is something they may feel but don't know how to properly articulate. This is amplified and exacerbated when people have these discussions on big media platforms. It's one thing to have a difficult conversation with a few individuals in private who are all speaking in good faith, but that good faith doesn't exist on Twitter, as people will latch on to a single misspoken word and extrapolate it into something completely different than intended due to their own biases or motivations. However, I think some red pill rhetoric is beneficial to society. Since facing certain realities of how our society functions, even if it means initiating very uncomfortable discussions is the only way we can improve it. So with that in mind, let's turn back the clock a little bit. While pickup artistry may seem like a recent trend, things of this nature sprang up as far back as the 1970s and gained popularity in the 80s when Ross Jeffries, the founding father you could say of the seduction community, began writing books and hosting seminars. If you've seen the film Magnolia, Tom Cruise's character, who runs a workshop entitled Seduce and Destroy, very classy, is based on Jeffries. Now I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that there is a minuscule chance that's just a coincidence that pickup came about right around the time of the tail end of the sexual revolution, where the normalization of concepts like non-committal sexual relationships took the rule book when it came to how men and women were supposed to interact and set it ablaze. Women, no longer stifled by societal restrictions, at least not as much so, realized that they, at the risk of sounding crude, basically had a monopoly on sex itself. This wasn't some unearthed discovery. Lysistrata came out over a millennium before the sexual revolution, brah. My boy Aristophanes knew what the fuck was up. And thus, men realized, oh shit, there are no rules anymore. The age of structured courting and monogamy is starting to break up, and women can now be far more selective about who they sleep with. They realized that they had to bring something to the table. How can they become the guy who she picks over all the other dudes? And thus, Pickup was born. And it's no surprise that as time went on, as more traditional views of relationships and societal restrictions on female sexuality began to fade away, at least slightly, Pickup began to grow, mostly in the form of secret clubs and later online. The movement was brought to mainstream prominence in 2005 upon the release of Neil Strauss's The Game, a tell-all expose on the seduction community, focusing mainly on one particular guru, my man mystery. And from there, the online communities exploded in popularity. And that is when everything went to shit. By that, I don't just mean Pickup grew into a drooling, seething monster, but in how detractors reacted to it. Upon the release of Strauss's expose, reviews were pretty scathing. Despite the book actually being less of a pickup guide and more of an account on how the lifestyle will lead to a miserable existence and how the central hub of the community Strauss was a part of, Project Hollywood, dissolved due to all the pickup gurus being narcissistic prima donnas, who would have guessed, it didn't exactly receive a measured response, with critics eviscerating it with sheer disgust, which is how most people react to the community today. But now back to the question that despite pickup being in the mainstream for so long, building massive communities communities, almost no one actually asks in a sincere way. Despite the intense disdain pretty much everyone directs at them, why do these communities continue to grow? Some may say that it is indicative of the guides themselves. A dude teaching me how to bang hot as fuck woman? Sign me up! Or of toxic attitudes towards women in general. A way of retaking control from them, if you will. In some cases this is true, but people who tout these explanations are, in most cases, putting the cart before the horse. Most guys don't get into it with the idea of fucking hundreds of biddies. Most simply want some sort of skill set when it comes to socializing with women. Okay, but if that's all they wanted, then why not get dating advice elsewhere? Well, we already went over that. From my experience, there are three main things that the pickup community has that other dating advice is missing that makes it so appealing for a lot of guys. One, relatability. Most gurus know exactly what it feels like to be in the average socially awkward guy's shoes, since that is where they started the themselves. As we went over, relatability plays a large role in who we are drawn to in terms of seeking advice or counsel. Two, 
a healthy dose of red pill. Not the more bitter and hateful aspects, but more so the tough to swallow pills in regard to dating or attraction or just life in general. Like being a short dude is going to make dating more of a challenge for you. Or no matter how good of a person you are, your dream girl isn't just going to fall into your lap or no one owes you sex or intimacy. Ignoring or downplaying these truths can actually lead to just as toxic behavior or attitudes. And three, well, it goes back to how messy the world of dating can be. So you have guys who have a dearth of social calibration and the rules of how relationships used to work being thrown out the window and societal expectations of men to be the one to make the first move. Well, obviously this can be incredibly daunting for a lot of men, making these guys desperate for some sort of map or logical way of thinking about all of this. They have their own language, by the way. And I'll, I'll get a call from a guy and I'll say, style was my name. And I'll say, hey, I was uh, in a two set and I was trying to, to neg the target, but I got IOIs from the obstacle. Should I have DHV or DLV? Assuming she was an SHB 11. And that'll mean something. Yeah, wow. but it means you guys are nerds. Is <laughs> totally, totally. Well, yeah, the gurus came up with the concept of structuring this whole mess as a game. The terms they use add some sort of logical process to what is a very illogical world. Value, the field, which is a bar or a club, target, set, terms used in sports, video games, things these guys relate to, some sort of framework which can be used to apply some sense of logic to approaching and flirting with women. And this works surprisingly well. Not in the sense that women are an algorithm that can be broken down to a mathematical equation, but in getting guys out of their head, allowing them to implement basic social socialization skills. Projecting confidence is demonstrating high social value. A girl giving you a look and smile is an IOI, an indicator of interest. And thus, they are successful at giving men that initial spark of encouragement via a structured game plan to get better with women. But of course, despite the pros, there are some pretty big cons. While applying a more logical structure to dating does give guys the push they need, the almost stubbornly rigid frameworks can lead to some pretty severe objectification. Women are not uniform in that they respond the same way to certain things, but instead of just telling guys, hey, here is a realistic assessment of how the dating world works, and here is a skill set that you can use to help navigate it while keeping in mind that your success is subject to a countless number of factors that you have no control over, well, that doesn't keep these dudes constantly coming back for more tips, does it? This is where so much red pill rhetoric goes bad, which is why even mentioning red pill probably made a few of you go, where are you going with this, chief? More extreme discourse has drifted away from giving a nuanced assessment of reality to allow people to keep their expectations in check and maybe even enter that world with the intention of trying to make it better to just justifying bitterness and frustration by reinforcing regressive and bigoted views. Did you know that black people commit 50% of the murder in the USA despite only making making up 13% of the population, that is quite the vehement and emotive statement. However, it is something we as a society need to recognize so we can take steps to address the institutionalized socioeconomic and cultural factors that led to this being the case. Social what? And thus, a lot of red pill rhetoric tends to take harsh truths when it comes to dating and extrapolate them into absurd and borderline delusional conclusions. Women are able to be more selective when it comes to sexual relationships. This is something you should keep in mind when entering the dating world becomes, women are programmed to find the most quality male seed to give them copious numbers of gigachad spawn. Or, hey, just being nice to a woman doesn't guarantee she will want to date or fuck you. That is a reductive way of thinking about how romantic and sexual relationships work. Becomes, women are drawn to men who treat them like the inferior species they are because they display the traits of the, of the dark triad <laughs> and their uteruses cry out for their superior appendages. <laughs> it's one thing to give some harsh advice to someone, but if you find yourself putting together a PowerPoint seminar on how a woman's ovulation cycle determines how faithful she will be, then like, I, I don't know, maybe just sit down and have some tea. This is where it starts to go downhill in the seduction community, where practical advice turns into reinforcing some very dark ideas. And it goes a little something like this. A young guy wants to improve his romantic life. He isn't getting practical or realistic advice from more traditional dating coaches. But then he comes across these guys who say, look, 
I get it. I was you. I know how you feel and I want to help you. So he starts watching their vids about eye contact, the unpleasant truths of dating, giving him strategies to navigate social situations. But then it slowly fades into a focus on not just getting the confidence to talk to a girl or get to know her, but how to close the deal to get her home with you. And slowly, the idea of women being different individuals begins to fade and the terminology becomes more objectifying. They speak of women as more of a species, as if female psychology is a math equation that can be solved. It no longer becomes about entering a reciprocal relationship with a woman. It's about getting something from her, like she's a vending machine. And so when a woman doesn't respond to your advances the same way others did, instead of recognizing that she is an individual, it's because you entered the wrong inputs. And so you watch more videos, practice more strategy, making sure that no matter what scenario you run into, you can get what you want from a woman. But in doing so, you begin to attach your self-worth to whether or not you can get it. And if you don't, for whatever reason, it begins to eat away at you. So you push harder, get bolder, not caring if she says she has a boyfriend or no. You learn tricks to make her feel down on herself. Use surrounding factors to your advantage. And slowly, no matter how many women you were able to get into bed, it's the failures that weigh on your mind. But your game is perfect, right? And so if she said no, it's because there is something wrong with her. She's a stuck up bitch, a teasing whore, a stupid cunt. And your view of this one woman spreads to more women, soon all women. And you reach this hellish contradictory existence where you seek validation from women while simultaneously holding extreme contempt for them. And soon that contempt begins to overtake everything else. And you are drawn to media that exacerbates it. At this point, you may not even be trying to meet women at all and you're just harping on about their infantile mindset or lack of morals and accountability. Maybe you decide to go your own way, which is fine in and of itself, but that contempt continues to plague your mind, causing you to continue to spew hatreds towards women as a whole. And then you start to think, maybe we need to go back to how things used to be before the sexual revolution, where societal restrictions allowed women's nature to be controlled. This is one hell of a rabbit hole, one whose beginning is driven by men who simply want a chance at a fulfilling relationship. While pickup can help a lot of guys achieve a healthy social life, there is a danger of them ending up just as miserable as they were before, but now infected to such an extent that they spread the toxicity to other men. In my experience, guys who benefit most from pickup aren't in it very long. They absorb the basic principles and separate them from the more toxic and objectifying context. This is basically what happened to me. I never got to a place where I became bitter or angry at women. Now, of course, that is not the end of my pickup story, but we'll pick that up later. But this simply is not the case for a lot of guys who join the community with a sincere goal of a healthy romantic life, but were exploited by these walking tumors. However, on the other hand, those who mock these guys aren't really considering the plight of the guys who enter pickup to remedy their distress. Some may say we need to work to get rid of general misogyny in our society. Like, okay, but again, this is to some extent putting the cart before the horse as to what drives guys to get into pickup. Some say we should deconstruct the entire concept of masculinity, which I suppose could work, but we're talking about a very substantial cultural shift. And the only way this can happen is if we take smaller practical steps. Telling a young man who is in distress to change his entire worldview, disregarding all the societal conditioning he has been subjected to for possibly decades without giving him any solution to quell said distress aside from massive social upheavals is simply asinine. Or we could do nothing and just hate on these guys. But that doesn't stop these communities from growing or solving the problem of the distress that a lot of young men face. And even if we do fix the societal root causes, this still leaves us with the Lord knows how many men who are still in turmoil. So even if we did slowly purge any and all pickup style channels from YouTube or the internet as a whole, what does that leave us with? Okay, uh, hey, I'm uh, Brendio. I also go by Derek. I, uh, I'm an incel. I'd say the way our media discusses the incel community is indicative of its ineffectiveness at addressing controversial issues. What strikes me most is the lack of even an attempt at any sort of empathy, not toward the repugnant rhetoric they tout, but rather what puts young men in such a position where they are susceptible to it. Following the numerous attacks committed by individuals, either part of incel communities or who are motivated by their lack of sexual experience, it's understandable that there wasn't a lot of nuance on this issue. But you'd think that, considering 
considering the danger these communities pose, that would outweigh the hesitance to discuss this issue and attempt to figure out how to prevent guys from being sucked into this rhetoric. But at some point, it seemed like the media stopped trying to engage in any sort of productive way, framing all incels as ticking time bombs frothing at the mouth. While many of these young men are so deep into hateful rhetoric that they need serious psychological intervention to be de-radicalized, many of them didn't start out this way. Most didn't seek to reinforce their own hateful beliefs, but adopted them after months, if not years, of being exposed to it. Same deal with the seduction community, and even the alt-right. Something as innocuous as the video of some SJW going batshit crazy can lead to channels which lead to other channels, and some kid can start to adopt some very dangerous and extreme views without even realizing it. The term incel was actually coined in the 90s by a woman who created a website to help people in distress brought on by their lack of success in romance. But today, communities like this have become riddled with spite and misogyny. There are still communities out there that, while they have distanced themselves from the incel label, still operate as supportive spaces for people who struggle with romance due to various reasons such as physical disabilities or spectrum disorders. However, despite efforts to crack down on them, hypertoxic incel communities are still thriving. And despite the media reporting on these communities, there rarely is an introspective discussion as to what leads to so many men struggling with a lack of intimacy and seeking solace online. Unsurprisingly, a lot of guys at one point tried to improve their social lives, but to no avail. One of the more prolific members of the incel sphere, if you will, is a young man by the name of Derek, who was featured in a Jubilee video, which seemed more focused on lambasting the toxic ideology instead of discussing how guys get sucked into it. A year before the Jubilee video, Derek was interviewed by The Fallen State, hosted by America's drunk regressive uncle, Jesse Lee Pearson. Beta! In the interview, Derek gives a detailed account of what led him to falling into incel culture, and it is probably something almost every guy out there can relate to, laying out a detailed map of almost everything I brought up earlier in this video about what puts guys in such a vulnerable position to fall headfirst down these rabbit holes. It pains me to say that the fallen fucking state gave a more nuanced understanding of this process than fucking CNN did with this absolute atrocity of an expose on red pill ideology, which is just another overproduced shit stain that says alt-right bad. We know, but what about guys still out there that are in distress? How can we reach them and divert them from going down this dark path? And the answer, in my opinion, is a hybrid of the two extremes, where we can look at these communities and understand where the turning points are. Where did that search for dating advice detour into anti-Semitic sentiments? It is especially important to talk to people who have been in these spaces and gotten out. I have read articles by sociologists, psychologists, people with decades of education discussing the seduction community, and it is embarrassing how disconnected some of them are in terms of understanding it on a gut level. You can know all the terms, read every book, but if you can relate to that initial itch in your skull that sends a young man down this path, then you will always be missing a piece of the puzzle. Part of the solution, I believe, needs to be communities like, say, that of which incels or pickup artists belong to, but are stripped of their more toxic elements. While of course simultaneously trying to implement broader fundamental changes in our society, these communities would be aimed at breaking down these ideologies, recognizing where the toxicity begins to spread, and making sure these young men don't fall down these rabbit holes. Now, of course, I am not lost on why this approach may be tumultuous. Forming a community that is significantly closer to these detour points can feel like you are enabling people towards these points regardless of your intentions. Like I said, the incel community was originally developed as a space to help people, but was ultimately overrun by toxicity. Shit, we are seeing this happen in real time. Though I had heard about it before, I had never actually taken a look into the female dating strategy subreddit. At first glance, it almost seems like a parody of the pickup community, giving women tips, strategies, and brutally honest information in regard to male-female relationships. However, what may have begun as a more ironic man-hating aesthetic is beginning to seep into more of an unironic framing. Vice Legit posted an article 72 hours prior to me writing this sentence in which a woman states she initially gained empowerment from the subreddit, but was later 
later banned after stating the idea of men being unable to be sexually assaulted was ridiculous. While I doubt this community has the potential to become as violent or dangerous as say the incel community, it may result in women seeking solace or encouragement being consumed with bitterness and perpetuating toxic ideas and rhetoric. And yet, despite the risks, I think we need to try. There are those that will always be pushing toxicity and will always be willing to hold out their hand to lost individuals and infect them. If we want to help them, we cannot just condemn and call it a day. We need to extend empathy and understanding to these young men and give them a practical alternative. With that said, despite the plethora of toxic rhetoric, I think there are many things we can take from the pickup community and reframe them into healthy and practical strategies, creating a more ethical style of pickup, if you will, helping guys get what they seek from these communities while standing guard on the edge of the rabbit hole. And thus, without further ado, I present to you Hello brethren, I am Papa Mac, here to cure you of your dating woes. Let's begin with the basics. It isn't exactly a secret that one of the biggest hurdles guys face when trying to improve their romantic lives is a little devil known as approach anxiety. The in some cases debilitating fear of initiating a conversation with a woman they find attractive. Many guys fear that a rejection will be a massive blowout where the hottie insults you, some giga chad pulls your pants down, which is in stark contrast to the reality of the situation, which is often a simple no thank you, I'm not interested. And thus, I present to you a simple yet effective strategy I used when I first started out. Find an area with a lot of foot traffic, grab a coffee, and go for a walk. Your goal is to ask 10 people for the time. Obviously make sure you aren't wearing a watch, awkward, say thank you, and you keep walking. A few minutes later, ask someone else. Ideally you'll want to ask women you find attractive, but if that's too hard at first, just ask any and everyone. If you have a friend in the same boat, bring them along and take turns asking. If you don't live near a busy metro area, try it at your local mall. Ask someone where a certain store is. Obviously try to ascertain if they seem like they are standoffish, but in any case you are only taking up a few seconds of their time. They may or may not know the answer to your question, but obviously that's not the point. Politely say thank you and move on. As you get more comfortable doing this, mix in a compliment. Turn to walk away, but then say cool shirt or something. At first it'll come off as forced or you may trip over your words a bit, but as you do it over and over, it'll slowly feel more natural. Try to make this a habit whenever you go out. Find situations where you can initiate not a full conversation conversation, but just a simple interaction. If you're at a coffee shop, make sure there isn't a line or anything and ask the barista what their go-to drink is. You aren't trying to expand this into a full conversation, just to go beyond the simple yes, no, and thank yous that make up the vast majority of social interactions throughout your day. The fear that guys feel when approaching a woman is brought about by them playing out every single horrifically embarrassing scenario in their heads. Like they see a pretty girl and go full on Doctor Strange, seeing every temporal extra Appalachian where she calls him a creep and throws her burning hot latte in his face. But you aren't hitting on her. You're just asking a simple question. There is no crash and burn scenario. And once you realize that the vast majority of people, yes, that includes women you find attractive, will not react towards you with hostility, but with decency, it'll start to internalize. You'd be surprised how many times asking for the time or for directions led to the person I asked initiating a conversation. People who are really isolated have this habit of assuming that everyone else is a social butt fly and is on their way to meet their big functional group of well-adjusted friends. When in reality, that person may feel the exact same way you do, and someone simply acknowledging them or giving them a compliment can make their whole day. This strategy is something you'll find on almost any pickup channel. This is simply a carried version of what is called progressive systemic desensitization. Progressive systemic desensitization. Progressive systemic desensitization. A fancy phrase that means doing the thing you are afraid of makes you less afraid of of doing the thing. After a while, you will be amazed, like I was, how much more comfortable you feel in social situations, as well as how your social calibration will have naturally improved. It isn't an exact science, but after talking to lots and lots of people, even for 10 to 20 seconds a pop, you'll get a feel for vibe, if you will. If someone is open to continue talking, if they're being short, the tone of their voice, you're never going to be a mind reader, but you will find yourself getting better at reading the room, if you will. But surely once I approach a woman with the intention of flirting with her, that anxiety will come back, right? Since the pressure is still on in this case. And to some extent, yes. This exercise is more of a warm-up. Most guys who are incredibly socially awkward try to dive 
dive right into approaching an attractive woman, which is like someone who gets stage fright playing ukulele in front of their dog wanting to gig at a sold out mass in Square Garden. It helps get rid of most of your nerves, but there is going to come a time when you just need to jump into the pool. However, you can use other pickup techniques to help you out, not by trying to manipulate the person you are talking to, but in terms of your own mental framing. But first, let's talk about appearance. Obviously, you can't control your bone structure or genetics, but you can optimize what you got. Head to a clothing store that is moderately priced and ask someone who works there to help you pick out an outfit. Seriously, they live for this shit. It will help you get out of your comfort zone when it comes to style. If you don't feel comfortable doing this, black shirt, black leather or bomber jacket, black jeans, white sneakers. It's a basic as fuck starting point. If you have the means, hit up a somewhat fancier hair salon and when the stylist asks you what you want, tell them you have no idea and you put yourself completely in their hands. Just be honest and say you're trying to get better with the ladies. You can choose a cut you like, but I like to do this as it gets me out of my comfort zone. And the stylist knows how to work your hair to complement your face. By this point, you hopefully will have gotten rid of most of your nerves and improved your social calibration. So approaching a woman isn't as daunting. So let's just use a simple get together for this example. You're at a party and muster the confidence to approach a woman you find attractive. The approach isn't important. Say hi, ask her name, compliment her shirt. It doesn't have to be fancy. Now let's go over the two biggest mistakes guys make that set them up to fail. Number one is envisioning how the conversation will play out in your head. This is deadly because you have already psyched yourself out before even opening your mouth. Hopefully your nerves will have calmed by utilizing the approach anxiety strategy, but it can still be present. However, number two, the bigger mistake is the mental framing guys enter this interaction with, which is having a specific end goal in mind, whether it be a phone number or trying to get her home with you. You need to train yourself to get this shit completely out of your head, as it is this end goal oriented framing that leads to the more manipulative techniques. The deadly framing guys enter with is basically, I want her to like me. Why? Because she's cute? You don't know her. She could be mean or obnoxious. She could enjoy beating up old ladies or her favorite film could be glitter. The reason you want her to like you is because you just want her for validation or sex, which results in you resorting to weird attempts to manipulate her or frame yourself a certain way, which comes off as try hard, even if you were not doing so consciously. However, there is a simple technique that can help sidestep step both of these mistakes. Just ask questions. Well, no. Well, yeah. Here, I'll let Neil Strauss put it a better way. The whole thing is guys are always trying to sell themselves to women. They're always trying to say, brag about themselves and say what they do for a living. And instead, you kind of got to flip the script, make someone who has absolutely no interest in you start selling themselves to you. And that's like one of the pieces. Instead of entering an interaction with a woman with the mindset of, I want her to like me, enter with, I want to see if she is someone I like. With this mindset, instead of trying to impress or to get something from her, you are simply seeing if she is someone you would like. And how do you go about doing so? Are you fine? Yeah. But not basic run of the mill questions. You don't talk shit about the weather or your favorite color or something. Questions that reveal things about her personality that actually mean something to you. This is going to vary from individual to individual depending on what you as a person value in another. This technique, one, naturally projects confidence, two, gets you talking about things that are important to you or are interested in, and three, puts yourself in a selective mindset. Not in the sense where you are judging her or acting as if she has to impress you. This is my one gripe with how Neil's description of the technique works in practice. A guy will tend to act as if he is the prize and she needs to chase him, which they refer to as having an abundance mentality. This is simply a slight variation on it that doesn't risk making you seem overly cocky or conceited. So when she answers, if it is something that resonates with you, probably so since you were discussing things you care about, respond with something about yourself, why it means so much to you. And ideally, she will ask you questions, which you will respond to, a process that in the scientific scholar community is a officially known as a conversation. But seriously, so much generic dating advice will give you boring topic to talk about while pickup artists will frame a simple conversation as if it's a multi-step sales pitch. This is the part where the be yourself mantra comes out. By asking questions in this manner, you communicate who you are and the things you care about without coming off as if you are doing so in an attempt to impress her. And if things go good, if the conversation's going well, suggest grabbing her number. Now here's the big thing. If 
if she declines, you need to understand that despite your anxiety's best effort to convince you of this, this could have absolutely nothing to do with you. Part of the difficulty of meeting people in public places, and part of the reason why a lot of pickup artist rhetoric is just borderline useless, is because you don't know anything about the woman you approach. Maybe she said no because she wasn't attracted to you, or maybe she's married, in a relationship, just got out of a relationship, just not in the best mood. Maybe she doesn't like men. Not that any of that has stopped any of these dudes. Guys who lack confidence tend to jump to the most soul-crushing explanation, which can be lethal. This is how a community or small group of friends whom you go out with can help. You get rejected on your own, it can stick with you for a while. You get rejected and get back chatting with your friends, it'll be off your mind in a few minutes. But let's say that you aren't comfortable with meeting people in public or don't have a group of friends you can go out with. This is where online dating comes in. I did online almost exclusively as I found it easier in terms of navigating the unknowns of approaching. If you get a match on Tinder, you know the person is available, well, at least they say so, and there is some semblance of mutual physical attraction. With that said, there are trade-offs. You approach a woman in person, your personality can give you a leg up. But online, looks, or rather just having good photos, matters a lot more. Shit, I had to find excuses to take photos when I went out with friends, and I just never thought to take pictures. You can always make a joke out of it too. Maybe take a few jokey photos and mention in your profile that you didn't have any pictures of yourself, so you had to wing it. Display your personality a bit. Apps like Tinder and Bumble can be a bit more treacherous in the sense that looks matter more, but keep in mind that many people may not be active or have even seen your profile. So don't be too hard on yourself if you don't get many matches. However, if you do find it's getting to you, you need to walk away. I have seen many a guy and girl have their lack of success on Tinder or Bumble do a number on them. Even if they get a decent number of matches, they almost subconsciously compare it to the number of people they swiped on and take that to heart. In that case, I'd suggest maybe trying OkCupid or a site that has a bit more of an involved process to sign up to weed out people who aren't really as serious about meeting someone. Okay, so let's say you get a match or say you got that girl's phone number at the bar. Now this is the most important part. I'm serious. These two texting secrets, these revolutionary concepts will improve your success by 8,000%. And they are say something more than hi, and for the love of ever fucking Christ, ask her out. Of all the confusing things about dating, why did seduction schmucks and self-help gurus alike decide to make fucking texting such a complex web of rampant overthinking? Do I wait this long before texting back? Here's how to generate attraction through texting. Stop, Christ, just say something more than hi or sup or does this look inflamed to you? Although I did once send a girl a picture of a bale of hay and she found it funny. Something as simple as, hey, how's it going today? Or, hey, how's this godforsaken app treating you? Will automatically put you ahead of the pack, as surprising as that may sound. If she responds, go back to the mindset I spoke of earlier. Ask questions and see if she is someone you think you would like. Read the vibe. Is she short with you? Not asking questions back? If so, politely move on. Also, I'd suggest, if a convo fizzles out or you can tell she isn't interested, just unmatch her immediately. Just letting it sit there, driving you mad like the telltale Tinder match will not do you any favors. But if after a few back and forth, she seems nice and engaging, you need to ask her out. You would be amazed how many women I went out with who said that despite getting many matches and chatting with a lot of dudes, I was the only person who actually asked to meet up. Some guys take the play hard to get thing too far and never actually get anywhere. And for the love of God, do not play the I'm going to wait X amount of time to text back. We aren't in the eighth grade. Besides, you want to try to set a meetup pretty shortly after chatting. For reference, my girlfriend of almost three years, upon asking me what made her join Bumble, responded with, boredom honestly, how about you? And I responded, same, do you want to not be bored and grab a drink? And now we're living together and she regrets it every day since I am very much a morning person and she most certainly is not. Then just make sure you are decisive about where you meet. Not in the sense of being demanding, but if you ask her, is Wednesday night good? And she says yes, then pick a place equidistant between you two and say, let's meet here at eight or whatever. Just pick a decent bar or coffee shop. It doesn't have to be fancy. If you couldn't tell, a lot of what I've gone over so far aren't really cheat codes, if you will. They are more or less just techniques to control outside factors that can complicate things. Hesitation, overthinking. This process isn't nearly as daunting if you can quell this stuff. All right, great. You have a date and you already know there is at least some mutual interest 
interest and attraction. However, are there other tips we can learn from our masculine daddies? Believe it or not, the answer is yes. One of the best tips I learned was a variation on what pickup dudes call a false time constraint. So basically the idea is you approach a woman and say something like, hey, I have to go in a minute, but I just wanted to ask you something. The idea is to not put too much stake in the interaction, since the woman you are speaking to assumes you won't be sticking around all that long and aren't going to be a nuisance. But again, while calling this manipulation is quite the stretch, I don't like any sort of pickup that has anything to do with trying to elicit a response from the other person. The technique is meant to get her to let her guard down, and personally, I just don't like that framing. I just think that is what ends up leading to guys transitioning into the more manipulative aspects of this stuff. However, a variation of the false time constraint was something I used to help put my mind at ease. So let's say you are planning a time to meet and you settle on Wednesday at 8 o'clock. So then say something like, oh, that's perfect. I'm actually meeting up with friends at nine, but that works. I'll see you at eight. The reason I did this was one, to not stress about the expectations of the date. I would always, even without trying, constantly worry if I should escalate or try to get her home, even if I sincerely just wanted to get to know her. So by setting this time constraint, it allowed me to relax and enjoy her company. It may seem innocuous, but it really made a big difference and helped me quell my overthinking. And two, it gives you a non-awkward way to end the date. There will come a time when you are out with someone and aren't really feeling it. Having this in your back pocket gives you a smooth way to end the date, if you so choose, without it coming off as too obvious. However, let's say the date is going very well. So come nine o'clock, be like, oh crap, it's nine. Did you actually want to have one more and keep talking a bit? I can run a little bit late. So basically you are asking her in a low key way if she isn't feeling the date. And this gives her an opportunity to say, nah, I should get going as well. Ladies, I am sure you have been in a situation where you want to end a date and you know how awkward that can be and the oh my friend needs me thing is pretty obvious so that, that doesn't really help quell the awkwardness well hang on what if she did want to stay but didn't want to keep you from your friends well in that case then she'll say yes to a second date with you when you text her the next day don't worry about it also don't pull the wait three days before calling or texting thing this is just more time to overthink which you want to minimize text her the next day and let her know if you are no longer interested or try to plan a second date Again, you aren't using this technique for some manipulative reason, but simply to make both of you feel more at ease as you aren't all that caught up in where things might lead and can just enjoy getting to know each other. But of course, if she is enjoying the date and agrees to chill longer, fuck yeah. And if it's going really well, then maybe invite her over and just say your friends can go on without you. So let's say she came over that night or you invite her over on a future meetup and things are starting to get a little saucy. Again, always ask for consent before having sex. Just do it. Don't think about whether or not she wants wants you or just to, just to go for it, it's alpha, just, just ask. However, instead of do you want to have sex, something that I would say is better to ask is how far do you want to go tonight? Straight up asking to have sex can sometimes add auxiliary pressure to the situation. And if a girl says yes, but later on she isn't feeling as comfortable, she may be less inclined to express this since she may think you were expecting to go all the way. By asking her how far she would like to go, you allow her to set the terms and communicate that you are respectful of her comfort. So if she isn't feeling it, she will hopefully feel more comfortable expressing this to you. Also, don't think you as a guy need to go that far as well. If she is down the fuck, but you just want to make out, fool around, you should feel comfortable saying as much and she should respect that. Now, why do I bring this point up? Because it comes from a very enlightening moment I had that, in retrospect, was a pivotal moment that made me realize the rabbit hole that I was falling into. So I'm out on a date with a nice girl and we end up going back to my place. For reference, I am a 5'10", 225 pound dude. She is probably around 5'4", and pretty petite. So we are making out in my room and I ask her, how far do you want to go tonight? And she responded with something that I will never forget. She said, is it okay if we don't have sex? Um, what? <laughs> like, I honestly laughed to myself wondering, like, why the hell are you asking me? Like, of course it's okay if it isn't something you want to do. But then I realized, oh, she's a woman in a room alone with a big ass dude that she has only been hanging out with for a few hours and she doesn't know if I was expecting for us to have sex and she doesn't know if she says no, if I'll get upset and if I do, well, she is in quite the scary position. Remember earlier when I mentioned those posts about women calling guys dense for missing their signals? Ask yourself, what makes this annoying? 
It's that the women aren't even attempting to see it from their side. They aren't thinking about how the man feels, what he is thinking in the situation, which is what happens with dudes who get too far into pickup. They stop thinking about what a woman might actually be thinking or feeling and simply presume based on their own narrow view of how they think women are supposed to operate. This is the detour, where the bad path begins. When you start talking about what all women are like or how they are supposed to react. Instead of empathizing, you are assigning an entire gender a very particular set of characteristics. And so no matter how many numbers you get, women you fuck, when you realize what you were told wasn't true, when the strategy stopped working, when the techniques fail, these confident alphas, rather than accepting it, will tell you you did something wrong or the woman was just a bitch or broken in some way. And that is where the slope begins. For me, it was that moment in my bedroom with that very sweet girl that I realized I didn't like the person I was starting to become. I may not have been bitter or jaded towards women, but I was seeing them as more of a means to an end. Where I realized the stuff these dudes were pushing wasn't teaching me to be confident or assertive, but selfish and one-track minded. Were there times when I just went for it, did what I wanted and the woman loved it, and I got laid whereas I wouldn't have otherwise? Probably. But were there times where I didn't think about how a particular woman was feeling and I went in for a kiss or something else and even though she didn't protest, it may not have been something she was super comfortable with, more than likely. And as someone who has been through this mess, down the line, when you look back, it'll be the possibility that you didn't take into account how she was feeling and that you made her feel very uncomfortable that will weigh on your mind, even if you had no ill intentions at all. While I think we can take a lot of useful information from the pickup community, once we start talking about attempts to manipulate manipulate or convince or jumping to conclusions, this is where I would say things begin to take a bad turn. And I think we can prevent guys from taking that detour by championing empathy and conscientiousness. That time a girl gave you her number when you asked for it at a party or a bar but never replied, the gurus will tell you you didn't maintain attraction or she was upset you didn't try to escalate physically. Or maybe there was a time when she turned a guy down and he reacted badly and she didn't want that to happen again so she just gave you her number despite not being interested. Whether or not that was the case isn't the point. It's about realizing to not take things too personally, to realize you didn't fail or this doesn't mean you did anything wrong, and to not presume you know why another person did something. Same goes for women trying to understand men. Hop onto that female dating strategy subreddit, well actually don't, like ever, but if you did, you'd find a lot of posts that, as a man, while some are simply venting frustrations, make it apparent said frustrations are brought about by these women assigning the most uncharitable explanation to men's actions based on why they think these men did something, thus perpetuating this damaging rhetoric, which is exactly what happens in the pickup artist community. Guys don't want to be angry or bitter, so they take a shot at improving their lives, only to find these same people who held their hand out and told them they could help them sent them down a road of putting your entire self-worth into something they can't control. But when the day came where they realized this, instead of helping them find the right road, they were told to blame others, which in turn kept them on that path until they were just as insecure and miserable as they were at the start. If you look at a lot of dating advice aimed at men and women individually, it's disconcerting how each side of the aisle doesn't seem capable of giving a nuanced perspective on how the other gender may be feeling. It's always, Guys do this because this reason, or if a girl does this, it means this. Even if it's something innocuous, it sets you up to be susceptible to this all or nothing, all men or women are the same mentality, which can lead to vast generalizations and sweeping statements, which can lead clearly to some extremely toxic rhetoric. Unfortunately, this isn't isolated to just dating advice. It seems discourse has become so vitriolic when it comes to women's and men's issues, many have developed a sort of knee-jerk reaction upon talking about one or the other. Believing as though talking about one means you were in some way downplaying the other. I was surprised to find comments on my male body video saying, well, women have it worse. Or, no, men definitely have it worse. Turning it into a contest of which gender has it harder. Yet each side is too preoccupied with scoring points, they never end up making anything better for anyone. Miscommunication between men and women when it comes to dating can't be improved by having discussions in our own bubbles. We must listen to each other, showing that we actually want to make this an easier lab to navigate. These pickup gurus, these red pill people, they'll try to convince you this is a war between men and women. It's not. It's a war between those men and women who are stuck in their own 
ways who are not open to change and those of us who want to make this entire process less scary, less bitter, better for everyone. This video is just a single piece of that puzzle, aimed to shine a light on the difficulties men face when it comes to this topic. And thus, I urge all of you watching to watch other videos discussing dating, romance, consent, men's and women's issues to prevent you from falling into a rabbit hole of your own, where only one side of the issue is presented, as doing so will never lead to anything becoming clear, like trying to complete a puzzle with only half the pieces. If you were a guy who was in the same position as I was, feeling as though you were doing something wrong, unable to understand why you weren't having success in your personal or romantic life, as someone who was on the tipping point of that rabbit hole, I hope this served as an extended hand to let you know that you aren't alone and there are ways you can improve these parts of your life without ending up in a bad place. For no other reason than when I began my journey, I wish someone had said the same to me. If any of this was relieving, hopeful, or helpful, then I am glad and hopefully it gives those of you who may not be able to personally relate to these issues some insight into them. And of course, if none of this resonated with you or you think I'm just speaking nonsense, you don't have to listen to me. But just don't listen to these guys. Oh, hi there. Uh, yep, still here. So while I put forth my ideas to help guys with their insecurities relating to dating and sex and think that practical steps like this are vital to help quell that distress, it helps to understand what leads to these insecurities in the first place so we can hopefully take note and prevent young boys and men from ending up there at all. And thus, it's time for the conclusion of my own pickup story. I'd love to tell you that after my many epiphany that night that my struggles were over, but I'm sorry to say they were only just beginning. It was thanks to that fateful night that I realized the bad path I was going down and was able to divert my course and basically live my life like a standard 20-something guy. I enjoyed time with my friends, went out on dates, and the skill set and confidence I got from pickup improved both my personal and romantic lives. It was great. Until one day, the unimaginable occurred. I met someone I really liked. She was funny, badass. We didn't put a label on it, sort of felt like we didn't have to. I was still swiping, but wasn't all that focused on it, realizing that I'd rather just hang out with her. Things went on this way for a couple of months, us growing closer, getting more comfortable. And then one day when she texted me asking if I wanted to come over, I ignored her text, deleted her number and never spoke to her again. I can't tell you why I did it, if I was in a bad mood, why I didn't just text her later when I wasn't. All I know is that I started swiping again. I was going hard before, but that was nothing. We're talking three to four dates a week, sometimes more. So did you become addicted to sex? Well, as strange as it might sound, sex became unenjoyable. It felt more like a performance, like I was just going through the motions. Okay, so what was going on? I recall one night I was out with a woman and I asked her if she wanted to come back to my place to which she agreed. And it wasn't until looking back that I realized that her agreeing to come home with me actually made me feel better than the sex itself. I didn't realize it at the time, but I had become addicted not to sex, but to validation. I had friends, a loving family, but I already had their validation. It was about making other people like and desire me. But once they did, I would just move on to seeking it elsewhere. And this is where the trouble started. I became obsessed with keeping that steady flow of validation coming, sleeping with the woman to get my fix, but upon waking up and finding myself alone and scared once again, would set back out to get my next hit. I would be at my job, hardly working, just trying to set up dates. I blew off going out with my friends. I stopped writing. Having a couple of drinks and getting stoned almost nightly was taking its toll, leaving me exhausted and drained. There were other women that I clicked with like that first girl, but as soon as we got close, I would find myself having difficulty performing in the bedroom. Yet I could go out the next night with a stranger and perform no problem. Ultimately, sex itself became the means to an end, something I completely divorced from intimacy, which made pursuing any sort of deeper relationship borderline impossible. I would just just get frustrated, blame her, convince myself I really didn't like her, and off I would go, leaving her behind. This went on for a long time, living what to some guys might seem like a dream, but was slowly becoming a nightmare. A nightmare which only came to an end after one night, where upon coming home alone, already drunk, I proceeded to take three more shots of whiskey, began punching myself out of frustration and self-loathing, resulting in a concussion and a busted lip, passed out in a pile of my own vomit, and woke up alone, having had pushed away any and everyone who cared about me. 
That same day, I looked into getting into therapy to help me break free of my destructive habits. So what exactly happened here? Suffice to say that while improving my social and romantic life did help quell a great deal of my distress, it felt as if it constantly kept creeping back up on me, as if I could just never truly dispel it. Upon realizing that I was happier, but still unhappy, I thought if I just kept at it, I'd eventually feel whole. Maybe I need to sleep with 10 women, 20, 30. At some point, I may have realized this wasn't the answer, but I had already alienated so many other aspects of my life that I didn't know what else to do. I constantly sought to feel whole, even as it resulted in me pushing away those who loved me, which only made me feel emptier. This is the danger of becoming dependent on external validation. But here's the thing, external validation is something everyone needs. When we enter the world, we need indicators that we're on the right path. Am I someone others like to be around? Are people engaging with my writing or art in a positive way? Self-assuredness isn't something you naturally have. It comes as a result of how comfortable you are in the world, of how validated you feel. But ideally, you want to reach a sort of equilibrium. We of course still need encouragement from time to time, no matter what age, but eventually most attain a form of self-confidence, comfort in your own skin. Yet sadly, it seems many men are starved of validation for, in some cases, their entire upbringing. So when they step out into the world, they do so with the hole in their sense of self, leaving them almost incapable of reaching that equilibrium, like driving with a leaking gas tank on an endless road. And no matter how much validation they acquire, it'll never be enough. This is compounded as men are burdened by the pressure to meet society's criteria as to what makes them a man, to be strong, assertive, the provider, to not show weakness or vulnerability. And so they work 90 hour weeks to get that promotion, take dangerous substances that destroy their bodies to be the biggest and strongest, resorting to whatever it takes. Many don't realize that they are on a doomed quest to attain something that will always be out of their grasp. And sadly, when they realize they can't go on, they are left broken down, alone, plagued by despair and isolation. Now you may be saying, what do you mean young men aren't validated. Western society is dominated by men in positions of power and wealth. But there is a vast difference between validation and expectation, between helping a boy become who he wants to be and telling him who he is required to be. Men are not encouraged to pursue things they find rewarding or that will give them a fulfilling life as much as they are expected to fit a certain mold. I spoke of how pickup can give men the skills they need to enjoy a healthy and rewarding social and romantic life. But you may be asking, why does so much of it focus on sex, getting laid, fucking stone cold tens. Well, the answer I'd say is pretty evident. Raise your hand if you've ever called a dude a virgin, limp dick, or said that he couldn't get laid when you wanted to insult him. Probably, right? I'm not exempt from this myself. In order to be seen as a man, you need to fit a particular mold. And one aspect of that mold, one of the biggest I would say, is a man's worth being defined by his sexual prowess. So much so that mocking a man for being a virgin or calling him impotent is almost universally the one way to get under his skin. That even those who criticize this can inadvertently perpetuate it. It was disheartening to see so many who I'm sure would be against mocking someone's sexual inadequacies making Trump's tiny hands jokes while he was in office. It seems they didn't consider how these jokes perpetuate the same harmful rhetoric they condemn. In order to quell their distress, men seek out to attain a large amount of sexual experience. And all the while, it isn't even the sex itself they desire. In the same way people don't seek money because they enjoy hoarding a bunch of green rectangular pieces of cotton and linen, but because of what it represents or can supply. Status, security, pleasure. Sex is simply a proxy to attain validation, which results in them not even considering the woman from whom they seek it as individuals at all. If you find yourself raising an eyebrow at me comparing sex with currency, well, yeah, it's fucked up, that's what I mean. It becomes something men feel they need to acquire as opposed to enjoy as a part of life, but it's never enough. This includes men who aren't even interested in the actual act of sex itself, as it is expected that they do and are deemed effective if they don't. Some people say the guy's getting virgin shamed. Is that possible? <laughs> There's something fishy because he's an a fo ex football player. Right. He's not overly religious, he has said, yet he's a virgin? Yeah, why? Because he says he wants to wait for the, the right feeling for the oh, person well, that oh, he has that on. connection with. Oh, 
buy it. When people discuss tackling the incel problem, for example, they assert ridiculous solutions such as enforced monogamy or subsidized sex robot. But it isn't the lack of sex itself that is making these men distressed, but what they perceive it represents. Worthiness, being wanted, desired, in addition to, of course, just a general human desire for intimacy. And the fact that many seem to be so ignorant of this or don't understand how these issues manifest themselves in men is another way in which they are not validated. Do you know how many times when I was feeling distressed about my lack of romantic experience, I wished I could just not feel that way, where I wish I could just not like even be attracted to women, where I could just be totally content by myself? I would bet almost every man out there who has ever felt inadequate due to their lack of sexual experience at one point prayed they could just not feel that way, to be free from that burden. And yet it felt like those who I sought help from thought this was something I could willingly get rid of, a burden I had put on myself, something that hadn't been hammered into my mind over the course of my entire life. Same goes with men being able to talk about their feelings and process their emotions. When I began therapy, it took me a few months before I was able to open up in any meaningful way. Not because I was afraid of being seen as weak, but because I physically couldn't do it. I would try, but I would, I would just shut down. I would desperately just want to cry, but my body would prevent me from doing so. Like I couldn't feel my emotions. It's hard to articulate, but I think many men can relate to what I'm what I'm trying to get at. Having been conditioned to bottle my emotions for so long, I was physically and mentally unequipped to do so. Yet it seemed many would assume I was not doing so out of stubbornness or arrogance or male pride. Trust me when I say, waking up in a pile of my own puke and blood stripped me of every bit of pride I had and I just want to get better no matter what I had to do. But even so, even those who do acknowledge this burden is something that has been placed on men, while they correctly say we need to validate young boys so they can feel comfortable in their own skin, whether or not they are able to live up to society's narrow view of manhood, they rarely acknowledge the men who are already on that road, and in some cases blame said men for not being the person they were never given the tools to be. They are told to be better, to get with the program, to just figure it out themselves. Because they're men, right? They are strong, capable. They don't need help. They just need to man up. And thus, the great bitter ironic cycle continues. Our society responds to the ill effects of young boys and men being deprived of validation by refusing to extend it to them. You will find numerous articles and essays asking why men are so angry, distressed, and isolated. Because many men feel they have unwillingly been put on an endless road with a leaking gas tank. And when they take a path they think that can help them find their way, despite how dark or treacherous its destination may be, the same society that put them on that endless road with a leaking gas tank criticizes, mocks, and shames them for resorting to these measures. And when those men finally give up, when they realize they can't do this on their own, when the gas tank finally runs out and they cry out for help, society only has one thing to offer. I want you to do something for me. Close your eyes and note the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear the word masculinity or manhood or, or being a man. Don't worry about whether it's not politically correct or if it's stereotypical or something. Just hold that thought for a moment because I want to come back to it. In 2019, YouTuber Natalie Wynn, aka ContraPoints, released Men, which is, I would say, one of the most nuanced and empathetic takes in regard to the struggles plaguing young men today. Natalie discusses much of what I went over in the last chapter, how these men are instilled with the need to measure up to the traditional model of masculinity that society has burdened them with while said society simultaneously condemns many of the roads they take in their attempt to do so. This is compounded by the fact that we are in the midst of some beginning to question and critique the entire idea of masculinity and gender roles in general. In theory, I would love to see young boys grow up in a world without being concerned about fitting a rigid definition of manhood and just pursuing whatever makes them happy. However, I worry how practical this actually is. Variation in preferences and behavior between the sexes have existed since the dawn of humanity, as a result of in some cases biological differences and how those differences manifest themselves in a particular culture. Thus, despite us challenging gender norms, is a society completely absent of them 
something we could ever possibly see. If not, then there will always be some sense of varying intensity of those in said society feeling pressure to conform to them. And this would be the best case scenario, if everyone was on board with doing away with gender roles completely. But factor in that there are those who are pushing back against this idea altogether and doubling down. It's not just enough to be content as you are as a man, you need to strive to fit an even more rigid criteria. This rhetoric is permeating our society to such an extent that guys can't even get away from it as it's starting to seep its way into other traditionally male activities. Shit, a few years ago when I was big into lifting and bodybuilding, I used to watch a lot of Elliot Hulse's stuff. And then I turn around and the dude has gone absolute batshit cuckoo banana pancakes. Should women have the right to vote? Depends on who you ask. Hey, babe. Babe. What? Babe. What? Do you think women should have the right to vote? All right, shit, okay, it's getting a little emotional, shit. Like, shit, dude, <laughs> when vegan gains, vegan gains has the measured take, maybe you need, to re you need to seriously reassess what the fuck you're doing. However, I am skeptical about the other extreme. Again, as much as I'd love to see a day of young boys and girls as well, growing up not having to worry about whether or not they conform to gender norms, that would be quite far down the line. So what do we do in the meantime? Young boys are facing a world that will instill this burden on them, and regardless of how much we validate and support them, it's still going to be an uphill battle. One which is complicated by some people's ridiculous assertion that masculinity and femininity are somehow opposites. Like, no, they are different in many ways, but they are more complementary, two sides of the same coin. Men are providers and women are nurturers, but aren't these basically the same thing? Whether you go to work to pay for your kid's food and shelter or stay home and make sure the twerp doesn't find his way into the cleaning supply closet, aren't you both giving this kid what they need to function in the world? Then there are some who who think the entire concept of masculinity and gender norms need to be set out to pasture. But again, how do we get there? If we just tell young boys that whatever they do or however they act or whatever they wear doesn't mean they are no more or less masculine, then what does masculine even mean? If it can mean anything, then doesn't it mean nothing? When young boys and men are sent out into a world that will constantly bombard them with conflicting and in some cases toxic ideas of how to be a man, if all we equip them with was a blank map, how can we expect them to be able to navigate this whole mess without ending up lost? And that is those who do have strong role models in their lives. Life. While my father wasn't around for most of my life, I was fortunate to grow up surrounded by male relatives, friends, teachers, and coaches, giving me a nuanced and varied concept of masculinity, and I still ended up falling down a dark road. Now imagine how it must feel for a boy with people in his life who aren't looking out for him, or don't have his best interest in mind, or who simply has no one in his life to guide him at all. So what do we do? How do we help boys and men find their way? Do we champion traditional masculinity, embracing it even more to help give them guidance, despite this possibly leading to Lord knows how many horrific outcomes? Do we just say fuck masculinity altogether, throw the baby out with the bathwater, leaving them stuck on that road filled with despair and isolation, and hoping they don't end up falling down a dark path out of desperation? Or can we reframe it, rework it, keep the criteria of masculinity, embrace traits such as strength, courage, being a provider, but discover where these ideas begin to set young men on a dark path and divert their course. This is precisely what I set out to do with Pickup. As someone who has been the hell and back through this process, I understand that neither extreme is viable, that telling young men to just feel content and disregard societal pressures to have a successful social and romantic life is asinine and invalidating, but that telling them that this is what they need to do to become men is toxic and dangerous. And so I tried to reframe it, validating how a young man in this position feels and guiding them along. And when we come to a fork in the road, I'll be there by his side to tell him which one is most certainly not going to help him. It isn't going to be easy. Mistakes and wrong turns will be made, but with every mistake and wrong turn, we can slowly fill in that map. One which we can pass on to the boys behind us on that road. But this isn't something I or anyone can do alone. Despite me helping a young man take the right turn at one fork in the road, he is going to encounter a shit ton more ahead of him. Some of which I won't know which road the right one is. Some that I, at only 28 years old, have yet to even come across myself. And that is why we need those men who have gone down these bad roads and thankfully have found their way back, whether it was the more vitriolic side of the seduction community, toxic incel ideology, becoming dangerously obsessed with fitness, abysmal red pill rhetoric, the alt-right pipeline, to retrace their own steps and stand guard at these forks in the road.
to help young men avoid the same wrongs they did. Of course, we should be open to anyone who wants to help. That includes those who can't personally relate to these experiences, whether because they are not men themselves or simply because they haven't faced these particular challenges in their life. But it is those who can both relate to these men and know where the detours are that are the only ones who can, and in my eyes, have an obligation to help fill in that blank map. To tell them to be a man, you need to be strong. But that doesn't mean you have to be able to put up weight like Scott Mendelson in the gym. It could mean you are able to admit when you need help and can't do it alone. There's nothing weak about that at all. I wasn't strong enough to take this step before I hit rock bottom, and I truly wish I had been. To be a man, you need to be a provider. But that doesn't mean you need to be capable of providing all the needs of your family or loved ones yourself. Sometimes it means just making sure your little twerp keeps his fucking ass out of the utility closet. I had let myself get in such bad shape, I wasn't able to provide for anyone, let alone myself. To be a man, you need to be courageous. But that doesn't mean you need to lead men into battle or be unfazed while watching the Donkey Island transformation scene from Pinocchio by yourself. Sometimes it just means answering a scary phone call from a friend at 2 a.m. and staying up with them until their parents get home to calm them down. For me, there was a time when I was in danger of believing that to be a man, I had to treat women like trash and see them as inferior, taking what I wanted from them before leaving them without a word. But now I know expecting others to supply me with my own self-validation wasn't manly at all, and that the manliest thing I could do was validate others, see things from their perspective, and not assume I knew the right answer to every question. I asked you earlier to imagine what came to your mind when you heard the word masculinity. Whatever image that strikes in your mind, which is based on your own personal experiences and influence. When I was younger, I might have pictured a dude with big ass muscles, nailing a stripper in a red Lamborghini, but now, one thing in particular comes to mind. When I was a freshman in college, I reached out to my dad, who had sort of removed himself from my life when I was in my early teens. I attempted to arrange a time for us to meet up and just grab some food or reconnect. The day came when we were supposed to meet up, and he bailed, leaving me on my own. In response, my uncle, with his pair of bad knees, got into his car on his day off and drove 75 minutes to my college and took me out to eat at, I fuck you not, what must have been the absolute shittiest pizza place in the nation. But God damn it, did it taste so goddamn good. I am still trying to fill out my own map, but all I know is that if one day I have a nephew and he ever feels the way that I did on that day, I'll have a list of shitty ass pizza places ready to go. As much as I'd love to leave this video on a heartwarming note such as that, I can't stress enough how vital this is in order to help young boys and men and to do so quickly. They are constantly at risk of being taken under the wing of others who will set them astray due to financial incentive, nefarious intentions, or simply because they are afraid to detach themselves from their own toxic rhetoric, as it may have been the only thing that was there for them when they themselves were alone and in despair. And I fear that, aside from these individuals, those who do know the danger that these more toxic roads pose are beginning to leave young men behind. When I was a younger man, I watched a lot of Jordan Pearson videos. I see Pearson as a difficult case, someone who I think is validating and even doing a lot of good for lost young men out there, but also who has some views that I think can lead to some more troubling rhetoric. Suffice to say, my opinion on the man is quite the contentious one. But the reason I bring him up is because in almost every interview with or article about Pearson, I kept seeing the same question being asked, the same observation being pointed out. Why, why do you think so many young men are following you? But does it, does it bother you that your audience is predominantly male? Does that, isn't, isn't that a bit divisive? Is it also appealing, reaching out to people, and in particular men, it seems, from all the surveys, men who are angry? And at first, I thought maybe they were simply pondering why Pearson's audience was mostly male, or maybe they were afraid of his opinions and ideology sending them down a dark path. But what I fear the actual answer is, is that these individuals saw that his audience was mostly male and branded it with an insidious notion. Instead of asking what Pearson or those like him may be offering to men and taking steps to try and give men what they are in search of, they simply saw a group of men coming together and regarded it with suspicion. My fear 
here is that any attempt for men to come together and try to discuss men's issues, in large part due to the toxic avenues that exist in the world today, will be faced with adversity. I am sure some of you, upon my announcement of this video's topic on my channel, may have had your own reservations, wondering where I was going with this or, if I would, even inadvertently, solidify and support some toxic ideas. I am not free of this concern myself, which is what made this video one of the most difficult I've ever had to script. But we can afford, for the sake of these young boys and men, to be afraid to do so, as giving up on them, regarding them with suspicion, refusing to extend to them empathy and understanding will only make them more isolated, more despaired, that much more susceptible to toxicity. I don't think I have to inform you of the various dangers that said rhetoric can pose, both for the young boys and men who are sucked in by it, and those who may suffer if they fall in too deep. Rather, I would simply like to share with you the story of a boy who, in my eyes, was never given the empathy and validation he deserved. And I'm on. What are you recording? Uh, vehicle accident in Burien. Okay, where? Uh, let's see here. First Avenue and 156. Got it. Any injuries that you know of? Not that I know of, but the, uh, the guy who caused the accident is, uh, still made zero contact, and he's exited his vehicle right now. The audio you just heard was that of a 911 call made on the night of February 2nd, 2018, when a man named Vili Falau, driving under the influence, caused a multi-vehicle accident in the city of Bury in Washington. To understand how we got here, we have to start at the beginning. In June of 1996, a police officer responded to a 911 call of a conspicuously parked van in a marina parking lot. Upon arriving, the officer located the vehicle in question. In the back seat was Vili, a week shy of his 13th birthday, and crawling from the back seat to the front, a woman, 34 years old, a wife, mother of four, Villy's sixth grade teacher. Villy and the woman were brought to the police station where authorities called Villy's mother who, unaware of what occurred in the car, instructed them to release Villy into his teacher's custody, assuming she had his best interests in mind. No further investigation was initiated. It wasn't until several months later when the woman's husband, upon finding a letter his wife had written to Villy, that an official investigation determined that the woman had begun raping Villy over a year previous. She was arrested in March 1997 and pled guilty to second-degree child rape. Three months later, while awaiting sentencing, she gave birth to Villy's firstborn daughter. Though originally expected to face multiple years in prison, as a result of a plea deal, the woman was sentenced to six months, only serving three, and was not required to register as a sex offender. A month after her release, the woman was caught raping Villy again, with evidence suggesting she was planning to kidnap him and take him out of the country. As a result, the woman was sentenced to seven and a half years in jail. Eight months after her second arrest, she gave birth to Villy Billy's second daughter. Despite his abuser being behind bars, the effects of her abuse plagued Villy throughout his teen years. Alcohol and drug abuse, run-ins with the law, horrific nightmares of suicide and death, he was teased relentlessly by his peers, being referred to as a teacher rapist. Those who were supposed to support Villy used his trauma for financial gain. At age 16, Villy attempted suicide by putting his fist through a glass window, cutting up his wrist and forearm. Villy's deposition made to the King County Superior Court, made public in 2001, lays bare the severe trauma he suffered as a result of his abuse. He speaks of his abuser with conflicting language, at times saying he loves her, at others showing a shockingly astute insight into how she betrayed him. I was just some toy, just a piece of a puzzle that she needs to finish to get herself out. I'd like to tell you that Villy was able to escape the clutches of his abuser and raise his daughters in peace. But sadly, due to those around him not giving him the support he needed, upon his abuser's release in 2004, she made contact with Villy and the two married the following year. Villy was by the woman's side when she passed away as a result of colon cancer in July 2020. Some of you may have heard this story before. I am certain many of you, despite my decision to not speak her name in this video, know who this woman is without needing me to tell you. Sadly, for those who have heard the story, you probably have seldom heard it framed in this way. The media seldom frame the story as it truly was, that of a young boy who was abused and raped, but as a public interest piece, a pop culture scandal, a story of star-crossed lovers. Interviewers sat across from a serial child abuser, in some cases with her victim at her side, conversing with her 
as if she was a celebrity of some sort. The reality of this situation was rarely highlighted in the language used to describe it. An affair, a sexual relationship, a toxic framing that, while more public awareness and conscientiousness have helped to fade out, is still present to this day in the numerous cases of female predators abusing young boys. Some of you may know the name of Billy's abuser and yet did not know or recall her victim's name demonstrating just how much Billy himself, his pain, and his trauma were reduced to footnotes. While I decided to not give Billy's abuser any acknowledgement in this video, I am about to show you a clip from an interview conducted in 2018, as I feel it is important to highlight how, despite Billy being in his mid-30s at the time, his abuser continued to manipulate him. Do be warned, it is very disturbing. That's why I asked him to get go get away from us <laughs> go and do your thing but that's I making said, it seem like villy was relentlessly pursuing you you were the adult you can say that i am saying that i was by age i was by age and Let's by maturity ah uh, you maybe you were a teacher mary you can't matter. say i was immature but you don't know him no but i don't need to know him in this discussion he's the child who was i'm the talking boss? about you who was the boss who was the boss? What? Who was the boss back then? You know, then? there was me pursuing you. But... Who was the boss back then? <laughs> this is ridiculous. No, this who is was? ridiculous. Who was? Just say. Just say? Who was the boss? Well, I knew it was what I knew back then. But who was the boss? He was 13, Mary. But who was the boss? This is getting weird. Who was the boss? Who? I'm pursuing the relationship. Who was the boss? Well, I was the pursuer. Yes. Mary, even as you're but hearing this now, come on, he was 13. It doesn't matter. I can't see this as anything but an abuser continuing to hold course of power over her victim. I can't buy into the idea that her torment over him has ceased. And as evident by Villy's DUI in 2018, the demons he faced as a boy plague him even decades later as a man. I can't begin to imagine what Villy goes through on a day-to-day -day basis. Trying to reconcile that a person he trusted, the mother of his children, someone he may have thought he sincerely loved, betrayed said trust, stole his childhood, was his rapist. In 2017, three years before his abuser's passing, Villy filed for separation. As of last year, it has been reported that Villy, no longer under the influence of his abuser, has begun to see things differently, and it sounds like he is finally being given the chance to heal and to take the steps necessary to process his past and trauma. I wish him and his children the best and hope that one day... Okay, like, look, fellas, let's, like, let's just talk us guys. Like, come on. Like, you think this kid is, like, that broken up about it? Like, like do you think any of these guys were? Like, have you seen some of these women? Like, let's be real here. Like, don't pull that pussy politically correct bullshit with me. Any dude would kill for this, right? I mean, what the fuck is wrong with him? Why, what is he so upset about? Crying because he got laid? You're saying this is abuse? Don't be a beta bitch. What are you, a pussy? What are you, a faggot? Come on. You're the boss, aren't you? I'd be willing to bet every boy or man has heard something like this, if not these exact words, many times in their life. To the point where these attitudes don't even manifest themselves as conscious thoughts. I told you at the beginning of this video that I would be honest with you, and thus, despite all the personal parts of my life I've shared over the course of this video, the following omission is the most difficult to make. As shameful as it is, there have been times where I have read a story of a female teacher abusing her student, and these thoughts pass my mind. I know if this was a picture of a male teacher and a female student, my mind would register to disgust and anger, but it doesn't with this one. I've internalized so much of this horrible rhetoric that I can look at a clear as day instance of abuse of a young boy in a tremendously dangerous and terrifying situation and my mind doesn't see it, which is exactly what occurred when Billy's abuse was first revealed or even in cases of young male rape today. It wasn't some conspiracy or evil attempt to downplay the severity of the situation. The language, the framing were as a result of people just not seeing their trauma, their pain, their loss of innocence, despite it being blatant, clear as day, in plain sight. Often when men's issues are discussed, there is a tendency to lose sight of who should rightfully be the focus. It gets brought into a larger discussion of politics or double standards or who's to blame. And yet because we are told that men don't feel pain or are not in need of help, the men and boys struggling with these issues are seldom addressed directly, left behind, sometimes not even purposely, even by people who are sincerely trying to help them. But in doing so, those who suffer from these issues are forgotten, pushed aside, and validated. They may be told why they feel a certain way or what won't make them feel better or given someone to blame but won't simply be listened to 
and help to find the right path, the most vital piece of the puzzle above all else. One, we must continually ensure we take the heart. Because if we don't, if we stop seeing these young boys and men as individuals and empathize with what they're going through, thus making them feel insignificant and worthless, then one day someone will come along and tell them they are not insignificant, that they do matter, and they will feel seen and validated for, in some cases, the first time in their lives, only to have the one whom they trusted, who claimed to be on their side, send them on a path that leads to a dead end of selfishness, bitterness, and emptiness, despair, hatred, and violence, betray their trust, rob them of their agency, and inexplicably fracture their sense of self, something we cannot allow under any circumstances, no matter what. To those men who may be watching who feel lost, alone, as if they are on a doomed quest, I hope this video in part is the beginning of helping you find your way.